Kenya's economy grew 4.8% in 2022, down from 7.6% a year earlier as a severe drought hurt agricultural output in the country, the statistics office said. Now, the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics said in its 2023 economic survey that agriculture, forestry and fishing contracted 1.6% in 2022 from a 0.4% contraction a year earlier. In September last year, the Finance Ministry forecast 2022 growth of about 5.5 percent and the KNBS said some of the key sectors that contributed to last year's growth were the financial and insurance sector uh, information and communication including transportation and storage meanwhile the Kenyan Treasury has raised the target for domestic borrowing by 103.7 billion Kenyan shillings in the 2023-2024 financial year underlining the state's increased reliance on local debt to plug the fiscal debt deficits. Final budget estimates tabled by the Treasury and Parliament show net domestic borrowing for the period starting July 1 is set to rise by uh, rise to rather 532 billion Kenyan shillings from 428.3 billion uh, Kenyan shillings this fiscal year. The higher target uh, for net domestic uh, borrowing is expected to offset a projected decline in net foreign financing to about 131.5 billion Kenyan shillings from 395.8 billion Kenyan shillings in the current fiscal year. So all of these we are going to be discussing on the show this morning. And I'm being joined by uh, Ali Khan Sachu, who is an African geoeconomist and macro analyst. He's also the CEO of uh, Reach Management. It's nice to have you join us again, uh, Ali Khan. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. So now that we're seeing that Kenya's economy, according to a report, was said to have slowed by 4.8%, down from 7.6%, and that was majorly because of um, severe droughts in the country that affected the supply chains and, of course, uh, production chain in the agricultural sector. But then when you look at it, you discover that it's been a recurring decimal. This particular um, natural-made um, uh, uh, catastrophe, as the case may be, it keeps happening over time in Kenya. But then do you see, or have you envisaged, or did you envisage that the impact will be this much on the country's economy? Yes, I think firstly, anecdotally, this was a markdown in GDP that uh, everyone on the ground felt was uh, accurate. Um, certainly, the economy did not feel uh, as strong as was being reported before we got this number from the KNBS. Um, last year, we had severe challenges with rain. We had uh, a drought across the country. Um, and therefore, as you reported, this story is largely an agri-driven story, uh, lower production uh, uh, and ultimately uh, poorer output. Um, so, yes, now this has been a perennial challenge, as you mentioned, um, and the only way to deal with it is to look at our water uh, management skills. We don't have sufficient dams uh, to, uh, for, for water catchment, um, and this has hampered uh, agriculture uh, across the country since independence. Um, the current administration has a very ambitious plan uh, to roll out dams all over the country, um, and if uh, this this plan is executed, then we should see uh, significant improvement um, and less of this sort of volatility in agri performance. So I think you know there is a plan to deal with it. It, it involves quite a big spend, but I think it's a priority because the agricultural economy touches so many of our citizens. Um, it, it's shrunk in value over time, but it, 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 its impact um, at the ground is extremely uh, wide because so many of our people will have a shamba, will have a small um, plot of land <coughs> on which they grow uh, fruit, vegetables and so forth. And therefore the impact, if you can address this, it will create well-being across a, a, a much, a very big swathe of the population. 
All right, well, even as we see that um, the Kenyan government is doing as much as it can in terms of measures and uh, mitigating effects uh, to deal with the issue of um, the severe drought. Of course, um, it's not only Kenya. When you look at East Africa, that seems to be uh, a norm and something they also have to deal with. But then in between the time of implementing these plans by government and the time span it will take for the implementation to begin to um, yield fruits, we see that um, citizens are struggling with um, the price of basic commodities that is spiraling, that is going up at this time. So how are these people surviving? Uh, how is life for them? How are they trying to cope with the issue of having to pay more for the scarce commodities they need to purchase in market to live with? It's been a perfect storm, to be frank. Um, uh, we've seen, as you've said, basic commodities skyrocket, prices people are paying for maize, maize flour, and so forth. The basic subsistence uh, uh, for living has increased very dramatically, and the inflation rate in many ways does not actually reflect the increase in the uh, basket of commodities people need uh, to survive. I think that's been much higher so it's been a vicious challenge. We've then had the government under significant fiscal pressure raising taxes on individuals. So it's been a perfect storm. And I think that's why there's been momentum behind the opposition's protests about the cost of living increase. And I think the government has to address this as best they can. They've gotten lucky because we've had some good rains in the last few weeks, and that should bring down food prices, which have already started to adjust lower. So there should be some respite. But there is no immediate silver bullet. You know, we've got to do a bunch of things which are going to bear fruit in the medium term. But unfortunately, in the near term, there is a cost of living crisis, no different to many other parts of the world, and people are suffering genuinely. This is not just a political story, it's a real story, and it's affected a lot of people on the ground. And I think, you know, from a political point of view, the government's got about 18 months to fix this. I think they're making the right moves, um, but we should see the rewards in the next couple of years. But bear in mind, in the Horn of Africa, We've had big problems with the weather. Um, the frequency of droughts has increased. Um, and therefore, we've gotten lucky this year, it seems, with the rains. But one can't count on those rains, you know, performing on a regular basis. All right. Now, economists have said that um, the Kenyan government is relying too much or so much on the agricultural sector for revenue generation. So are, are there other sectors of the economy that you think that um, Kenya should be focusing on for a more stable revenue flow, aside agriculture, maybe energy, or some other areas that you think can bring some sort of stable and free-flowing cash um, into government coffers? That's, that's another very interesting question. I mean, the government has gone for a tax grab. We're seeing increases across um, the spectrum of taxes. And I think some of these are going to be counterproductive in the sense that they're not going to raise as much as the government might be expecting. And it would also slow down investment. So, for example, at the stock exchange, there's a proposal to increase the dividend withholding tax at the bond market, where we've seen significant undersubscriptions in the local bond market, there's a proposal to increase the tax on uh, on, on on securities. Um, uh, with the, I saw a proposal which is to raise VAT on fuel from eight percent to sixteen percent. I'm, you know, I think the government is in a bind. It needs to raise revenue somehow. But I think we're hitting that point in the Laffer curve where you really can't tax people anymore. It's going to be counterproductive and there's going to be a boomerang effect. And I think we're at that point. So it's a serious challenge. And, you know, if I was setting tax policy, um, I would be looking to lean on my partners more aggressively. And I would be looking to taper some of these tax increases because of this boomerang effect I'm talking about. Um, the government has a fiscal challenge right now. Uh, in town this week was the head of the IMF, uh, Ms. Georgieva. Um, in town this week was the, was the Japanese Prime Minister, um, Olaf Scholz, the German uh, Chancellor. 
So I think the government has made a strategic decision to pivot back to the West um, and the multilaterals. And I think these folks have got to pony up about $4 billion in the near term for Kenya to get over this uh, challenge right now. I think the government has conceded much too much on the tax side, uh, probably to the IMF, who are our, our biggest lender right now outside China. And therefore, you know, you're, we're facing a conundrum where the reflexive action is to raise the tax in order to gather the revenue. But, you know, you can only squeeze a lemon so much. And at some point, the pips start to squeak. And I think the pips are squeaking now. So if you're saying that um, the government is um, focusing more on tax revenue, uh, are you saying that if it deviates from that, it should lean more to um, international institutions like the IMF, as you've mentioned, or maybe the World Bank, or other um, foreign creditors, as it were, to get um, loans uh, to fund its government. Now, if that happens, of course, you know that it's a trend in Africa where you have them, these um, uh, African governments go on to borrow and it affects its debt portfolio that is said to be rising. So if Kenya decides to toe that line, do you think it will affect um, its debt status? Because of course, um, so many African countries are on the threshold of default. Uh, so Sorry. many of, yeah, yeah. So, so, so how do we not deal with that? Okay, so our debt status is already affected quite badly. Um, our euro bonds are trading at more than a thousand basis points over the equivalent US maturity bond, which is typically signaling a distress level. So you're completely correct. We're in a hole. We're, we've got to stop digging. And what I, what, uh, what I didn't add to the comments I made before, uh, um, you know, the government has not been able to pay salaries. There's been a delay in, in disbursement. So there's a genuine cash crunch going on right now. And what I'm saying is that, you know, we've got to lean on the IMF and the World Bank to get us over this near term cash crunch. But at the same time, we're going to have to make serious reforms and cut back on the size of the government and the recurrent expenditure bill. We simply cannot support the current recurrent expenditure bill and the projections of its increase, which are, is, is, is a double digit projected increase for the next foreseeable future, this is not sustainable. I think by bringing in the IMF and the likes of the World Bank, they can be used as political cover for the government because it's always difficult, if not impossible, in my experience, for African governments to reduce their size. But here, I would be pushing the government to use the IMF and the World Bank to make those difficult decisions um, around reducing the, the, the salaries component and the recurrent expenditure. We're at this cash crunch point because that has gone, gotten out of hand. We've got to get it back under control. And I'm saying, borrow some money from the World Bank and the IMF to tide you over this difficult time, but the quid pro quo for that and I'm sure it is a quid pro quo that's already been put in front of them, is that you've got to now take a knife to the recurrent expenditure bill and reduce it and put it on a sustainable footing because the, because the tax collection cannot sustain it and the borrowing is becoming more and more difficult and therefore you're going to have to do something. And that, that's, that, it, without doing that, this is not a sustainable economic program. All right, so um, just as um, the Kenyan government is now trying to plug the uh, fiscal deficit, um, the Treasury said it had raised um, the target for domestic borrowing by 103.7 billion um, shillings for the 2023-2024 financial year. So do you think that is a wise move to take? Well, you know, I'm, what I've described to you is a cash crunch, and mm -hmm. uh, they, they've got to raise it in order to plug the gap. I don't think, I think the gap will be even bigger than that, because I don't think they're going to collect what they're expecting on the tax side. But, you know, and, and then they're facing serious challenges, particularly in the domestic market, where everyone has gone into 91-day T-bills, and everything else is being undersubscribed by massive amounts. They are unable to sell securities with a longer tenor. So it, it, it's, it's a complex uh, situation. I think they've got to show willing, as I said, to reduce the recurrent expenditure, the cost of government, 
they they can plug the gap because they have got considerable political cover and support from the West. This was a deliberate decision by the administration and the correct one, given what you know China's credit line to us has been maxed out. So that's the correct one. But they're difficult decisions ahead of us, and there is no silver bullet. And really, we're going to have to bite down hard, as I said, particularly on the government bill that the taxpayers having to uh, underwrite. All right. Um, let me just uh, go back to the report. Um, it stated that short-term uh, treasury bills have historically been preferred by investors or longer-dated um, government assets are said to have been required uh, higher risk-adjusted returns. Now, would you think would be sought after in terms of the two? Would you think that investors would look out for more? So at the moment, investors are at their most defensive I've ever seen them in the last 20 years. They're putting all their money into the 91-day uh, Treasury bill. Um, we're seeing undersubscriptions in the uh, uh, half-year bill and the one-year bill. We're seeing massive undersubscriptions in longer tender bonds. This has created two issues which are uh, um, secondary effects. Uh, uh, banks and pension funds are holding an enormous number of these bonds because of uh, the, many of them considered them risk-free, erroneously, obviously. Um, they did not consider the interest rate risk. So you've got a secondary market now. For example, you know the, the, the government was trying to sell some, uh, I think, 10-year bonds at something like 14%. The secondary market is 165 to 17%. So there's just no way, unless you're an insane investor, you're going to buy the primary market. You're, if anything, you're going to go to the secondary market. But the problem is, if you mark to market the balance sheets of the banks and the pension funds, they've got significant losses, and therefore they don't have the capacity right now to be buying uh, bonds um, in, in any meaningful way. So it's become a double prop, it's become a double-edged sword. Even if you now go to the market level, you're going to be marking to market all these fund, all these pension funds and banks. Um, and the question is, would you find uh, 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 demand at those levels? So it's a real conundrum, um, and 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 very difficult for you know for the treasury to manage, frankly. All right, uh, permit me to quickly chip this in, um, Ali Kansachu. How diversified um, is Kenya's economy? Uh, would you say that if, if it is broader, uh, if it is that diversified um, in, a, in, a, in a very broad way, more than it used to be now, you think it would help its economy in any way to, in terms of transformation now, and um, any positivity can come out from that? Yeah, so I think, you know, if I look at Kenya's economy, it is diversified, it is very dynamic, it's very entrepreneurial. Um, uh, you know, you, we focus on agriculture, which is a historic uh, uh, pillar of this economy. we got a dynamic IT, internet, uh, a tele, uh, telecommunications economy that's been growing, you know, at an average of about 20% CAGR now for a couple of decades. Um, we've got a very dynamic human capital base, and I think, um, uh, uh, you know, as a country, uh, this is why Kenya is so attractive to the multinationals, it's so attractive to um, the banking sector, that's why the East African banking sector really sits in Nairobi. So, look, there is tremendous potential in this economy. I don't want to paint, but there are challenges, and these challenges are not easy to resolve. But um, I, and I think one of the mistakes we're making is we're be, we went, we've gone from a low tax economy, highly dynamic, to a high tax economy. And I don't like that. I don't think that makes sense. And we've done it without thinking. We just look at, our, look at the bills and say we've got to tax people more. Whereas we should be saying we've got to cut the cost of government more, reduce the tax, and allow our people to be dynamic and create more tax collection through their dynamism. So that's that's my overall feel. Unfortunately, I think a lot of these tax policies are being introduced by the IMF, and that's one of the prices of the support that comes from the IMF. But bear in mind, the IMF is lending us money at very low rates, below market rates. So we are bringing the interest costs under control to some degree by migrating our loans from 
commercial loans into IMF and World Bank concessional loans. But, but you know, we've got a window now of like 24 months to fix things, to get Kenya back on track and get it back into a high growth, highly dynamic space. Um, and that needs to be done. But in the uh, but you know, these are the challenges that I've tried to outline. There are plenty of them. But at the same time, Kenya has levers which I don't think other countries in the region necessarily have. All right. So uh, basically what we're seeing is that um, the Kenyan government is looking for the right, right solutions um, in the wrong um, areas, as it were. And it would just be important for them to um, plug it right in terms of knowing what is necessary that needs to be done um, for a positive economic growth for the country. But then we appreciate your presence, Ali Khan, for joining us. Thank you.